the beginning was the Word. And the Word was with God. And the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. And through Him, all things were made. Without Him, nothing was made that has been made. In Him was life. And that life was the light of all mankind. The light shines in the darkness. And the darkness has not overcome it. Wow, Merry Christmas, everyone. Isn't that a great video? Hey, I want uh, to invite all the kids, if you're a child and you want to be read a special Christmas story from Pastor Jordan this morning, I want you to make your way forward to the front. Parents, you might, might have to kick them out of your seats. Come on. It, so good to see the, the mini Oakmans here today. That's right. Come on up. I've got a great story for you guys. Are you excited? This is the second time you've heard it already today, huh? Right, Madison? Okay, here we go. Are you guys ready? Come on up. Come on up. It is so exciting to see you all. You sang so beautifully, so wonderfully. And uh, do any of you want to sit over on this side? Maybe a couple of you guys? Okay. Maybe not? Okay, I'll just kind of... All right. Well, why don't you look out and just say, Merry Christmas, Mesa. Mesa, do you want to say Merry Christmas back? Merry Christmas. Awesome, awesome. Well, what we're going to do this morning is we're going to read from the Jesus Storybook Bible. Great gift for a young family. Um, and this is the Bible that I read to my kids from. And unfortunately, Judah got a fever last night. So my kids aren't here. And it was a real disappointment. But do you, you have this? You do too? I'm getting some affirmation, so this is a good sign. Um, But uh, they can't be here, but we got to hear you sing, and you all did such a great job. So I want to read a very special Christmas story to you guys, and everyone from Mesa gets to hear it, okay? Now, you might have heard this story before, but pretend like you haven't, all right? I already read the whole Bible. You already read the whole Bible? Okay, well, let's just pray God gives us something just for this morning that will help us. All right, here we go. You ready? Are you ready, Mesa? All right, here we go. The light of the world. This is the story of the shepherds from Luke 2. That same night in amongst the other stars, suddenly a bright new star appeared. Of all the stars in the dark vaulted heavens, this one shone clear. It blazed in the night and made the other stars look pale beside it. Do you see that big star? Do you see that big star? It's almost like my park. It's all, almost like what? Park. Your park? It's almost like a star in your house? No? Okay, we're going to keep going. God put it in there when his baby son was born to be like a spotlight shining on him, lighting up the darkness, showing people the way to him. You see, God was like a new daddy. He couldn't keep the good news to himself. He'd been waiting all these long years for this moment, and now he wanted to tell everyone. So he pulled out all the stops. He'd sent an angel to tell Mary the good news. He'd put a special star in the sky to show where his boy was. And now he was going to send a big choir of angels to sing his happy song to the world. A lot like you guys just sang. He's here. He's come. Go and see him, my little boy. That's what God said. Now, where would you send your splendid choir? To a big concert hall, maybe? Or a palace, perhaps? God sent his little hillside outside little town uh, to a hillside outside of a little town in the middle of the night. He sent all those angels to sing for a raggedy bunch of shepherds watching their sheep outside of Bethlehem. In those days, remember, people used to laugh at shepherds and say they were smelly and call them rude names, which I can't possibly mention here. Can you believe that? They used to call shepherds mean names. You see, people thought the shepherds were nobodies, just scruffy old riffraff. But God must have thought shepherds were very important indeed because they're the ones he chose to tell the good news to first. 
That same night, some shepherds were out in the open fields, warming themselves by a campfire, when suddenly the sheep darted. They were frightened by something. The olive trees rustled. What was that? A wing beat? Wow. Wow. They turned around. Standing in front of them was a huge warrior of light blazing in the darkness. Don't be afraid of me, the bright shining man said. I haven't come to hurt you. I've come to bring you happy news for everyone everywhere. Today in David's town in Bethlehem, God's son has been born. You can go see him. He's sleeping in a manger. Behind the angel, they saw a strange glowing cloud, except it wasn't a cloud. It was angels, troops and troops of angels armed with light. And they were singing a beautiful song, glory to God, to God be fame and honor and all our hoorays. Then as quickly as they appeared, the angels left. The shepherds stamped out their fire, left their sheep, raced down the grassy hill, through the gates of Bethlehem, down the narrow cobble streets, through a courtyard, down some steps, 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 past an inn, round a corner, through a hedge, until at last they reached a tumble-down stable. They caught their breath. Then, quietly, they tiptoed inside. They knelt on the dirt floor. They had heard about this promised child, and now he was here, heaven's son, the maker of the stars, a baby sleeping in his mother's arms. And this baby would be like that big, bright star shining in the sky that night, a light to light up the whole world chasing away darkness, helping people see. And the darker the night got, the brighter the star would shine. Did you know that Jesus is the light of the world? Let's pray a quick prayer, okay? Everyone hold hands. Dear Jesus, I thank you for all these wonderful children and the next generation that they represent. And Father, we pray. Amen. We pray that you would shine your light in their lives and help us to be a light that would point them to the light of Jesus Christ. We are so thankful that Jesus has been born and we can have relationship with the God of the universe. Shine brightly in our lives too. In Jesus' name I pray. We all said amen. amen. Let's give it up for our kids. We love you guys. You can go sit with your parents. We're so grateful for each of you. Let's just give it up for our kids one more time. Yeah, that's right. You can never applaud kids too many times. Well, we're grateful that you're here. Merry Christmas, Mesa. Turn to your neighbor and say, Merry Christmas. Now turn to the neighbor that you neglected and say, Merry Christmas. <laughs> Awkward moments in church are always good. We're grateful that you're here this morning. We pray. We pray that in the busyness and the hustle and bustle, that Christmas would be meaningful for you. And that is our hope. As a family, um, we have been trying to figure out what exactly can we do for our kids to help them think about the themes of Christmas theologically. How can we help them think about things like light? And how can we help them understand what does that mean? So one of the tra traditions that we started this year um, we'll, see if it, we'll see if it continues, is we decided to take our whole family to the Orange County Fair Festival of Lights. I'm not sure what it's called, but you know the big thing, if you drive by the Orange County Fair right now in the evening, it's, uh, it's lit up and there's all sorts of lights. It's beautiful. We're so excited about it. So Tara, she buys the tickets and we drive over there and we get the kids in their Christmas pajamas. Are, is anyone excited about Christmas jammies? Anyone? Next year we should, we should have the Sunday before Christmas just jam, like, come on, wear your Christmas pajamas. Um, but we decided to let the kids wear their Christmas pajamas, so we piled them in. We had our hot cocoa and our Christmas jammies, and we're in our car. And the way that it works is the radio is connected to the different stations that you drive through. 
And so we pull up, and we pull up in a line, and they do it by line. And so we're all excited. We're trying to figure out our radio, and we've got the Christmas music blasting, and the lights are big, and we're just excited about it. And uh, we, we, we pull into the first kind of station through that first part, and um, we're, we're pointing different, you know, things out and different light um, structures out. And uh, I, 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 I'm listening to the back chatter, and I'm hearing Harper, but I'm not hearing Judah. And I, again, we want to, you know, create a beautiful tradition. So I look behind my seat because Judah sits directly behind me in terms of where I was. Tara was driving. That's another story all into itself. If you guys are wondering, why does Tara drive? It's, it's, I can explain. But I was sitting there and I turned around and Judah was just out cold, just sleeping, (sighs) you know. And I turned to Tara and, you know, we just chuckled, you know, because when you're three, it's hard. It's hard being three. Um, and uh, and it's, it was disappointing not to have Judah up here as the youngest little guy in the choir, because I'm sure he would have entertained all of us. Um, but, uh, but he was sleeping. And I just had this thought. I hope that we don't sleep through Christmas this year. We can't sleep through any moment that is infused with meaning to help us understand life better. Mesa Church, don't fall asleep this Christmas And here's the connection to our message today. Without light, we cannot see physically, but neither can we see spiritually. So what does the birth of Jesus have to do with light this Christmas? This is where we've been the past few weeks. We've seen how God guided the Israelites by the pillar of fire by night and the role of the Holy Spirit guiding us in our day-to-day decisions, but also in the way that we live our life, the trajectory of our life. And you can tune in and listen to that message a few weeks ago. Pastor Sharon, a few weeks, uh, the week after, talked about um, how God's word is a light unto our path and the role of scripture guiding us along our way, helping us to become more and more like Christ. Last week, we talked about how um, God guided the Magi, the wise men, by the light of the star that pointed to where Mary gave birth to Jesus and how God's supernatural methods of communicating to us are still possibilities in the world that we live in today. God still speaks through things like signs and wonders and healings and miracles, and he still wants to communicate to us right where we are. And today we're going to explore how this baby boy would claim to be the embodiment or the incarnation of all spiritual light and how ultimately Jesus will guide us through this journey. I want you to turn with me in your Bibles to John chapter 1. We're going to read the first five verses this morning. In the beginning, the Word already existed. Um, The Word was with God, and the Word was God. He existed in the beginning with God. God created everything through Him, and nothing was created except through Him. The Word gave life to everything that was created, and His life brought light to everyone, and the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness can never extinguish it. Now, you might be thinking, this is not a typical uh, nativity story. It's not a typical Christmas story that I hear. I'm used to hearing something from the prophets. I'm used to hearing Matthew or Luke's version of the nativity. But this is very much a story about the birth of Christ, Because this is John's way of describing theologically what is happening when God becomes flesh. Which you read about in verse 14, when he connects the word to the word became flesh. In other words, when Jesus was born. But this is one of the interesting things about scripture. Is it clearly explains that Jesus didn't start to exist when he was born. I read something just this week that apparently has become a point of misunderstanding in churches that about half of all Christians are not sure about whether or not they believe that Jesus existed before his birth. Uh, It's passages like this that so very clearly from Scripture tell us that the second person of the Trinity existed before he became human, and he connects the birth of Christ to the beginning of creation. In fact, when you open up your Bible and you read Genesis 1, Genesis 2, and Genesis 3, and you read about how God spoke things into existence, it's John connecting God speaking something into existence with this Greek word logos, 
which literally just means word. It's an expression. It's a principle. And he is saying that Jesus was intimately involved in the creation, not just of every light that exists, but in all of creation, every time God spoke. He says it so clearly that Jesus is involved, that every member of the Trinity is involved at the beginnings of the universe. The Spirit hovers over the abyss, and Jesus is involved in which creation is all spoken into existence through Him. He is the eternal Logos. And all light which was created is created through Jesus. And so physically, the light, the sun, and the moon and the stars help us to see physically. But throughout Scripture, we see that humans are in need of more than just physical sight. Even so, Jesus created all these sources of light. Verse 6 says this, God sent a man, John the Baptist, to tell about the light so that everyone might believe because of his testimony. John himself was not the light. He was simply a witness to tell about the light. The one who is the true light, who gives light to everyone, was coming into the world. He came into the very world he created, but the world didn't recognize him. He came to his own people, and, when, and even they rejected him. But to all who believed him and accepted him, he gave the right to become children of God. They are reborn, not with a physical birth resulting from human passion or a plan, but a birth that comes from God. So the word became human and made his home among us. He was full of unfailing love and faithfulness. And we have seen his glory, the glory of the Father's one and only Son. So we see in the first five verses that all light was created through Jesus. And we see in these last verses that all lights point to the light of Jesus. John the Baptist is um, a guide. He is a person that is pointing to Christ. You could say that he's a little flashlight pointing his flashlight to the bigger spotlight of who Jesus was. Friends, this Christmas, I think we need to recommit ourselves to this concept of pointing people to Jesus. Talk about a gift that your friends and families need. But sometimes we get a little, I don't know, we get a little... Um, unsure of ourselves as it relates to our ability to point people to Jesus. You know, John the Baptist was an expert at this, right? I mean, from the moment he was born, he knew who Jesus was. There was something about John's um, uh, spiritual recognition of Christ that actually starts before he was born. In fact, in fact, when Mary goes to visit uh, her cousin uh, Elizabeth in her hometown, it says that the baby in the womb of Elizabeth, John the Baptist, who would eventually become John the Baptist, it says that he leapt in her womb. There was something about the presence of Jesus that caused John to recognize him at such an early age. I've, I saw a, a, just a meme floating around social media that just said, you know, pause and recognize that an unborn child was the first to recognize the divinity of Jesus. How powerful that is, that there is a spiritual DNA and these receptors that John the Baptist had as an unborn human child that recognized that there was something special about Jesus. And of course, his cousins, they would have known each other growing up and when God called John to prepare the way for Christ, he would go out to the Judean desert, and he lived a very unique ministry. And when he saw Jesus, he recognized not just his cousin, but there, there was something about Jesus that would uh, fulfill his message and take his message of repentance to a deeper level, to the next level. And God actually used John the Baptist, the cousin of Jesus, to baptize Jesus, God incarnate. <laughs> he says, how are you using me to do this? But so that all things would be fulfilled prophetically, Jesus has John baptize him. And at that moment, the voice of the heavenly father uh, opens up and supernatural revelation comes down and, the, and they hear his audible voice. This is my son whom I love, whom I am so well pleased with. And John points his light to Christ. It's it's a humbling passage in the life to read about, even as Christ says about John, this is one of the greatest, because his ministry was a ministry of preparation for Jesus. Um, even when his own disciples 
begin to abandon him and desert him, they were going to Jesus. John says, he must become greater, I must become less. And in John, there's this beautiful image that we all have as dads, as moms, as pastors, as teachers, professionals in all sorts of arenas that our job is only to point people to Jesus. We know that scripture points people to Jesus. Jesus claims this himself. Later in the book of John, he says, all the prophets, the Old Testament, all these stories from the Torah, they all point to me. Do you see it? Remember those at the road uh, uh, on Emmaus, how Jesus had to explain how all of these things led up to him. Well, what does that have to do with me this Christmas? Well, if you're a mom or a dad or, or someone with any realm of sphere of influence, I believe that God's called you to be a light to point your family to Jesus. And when you hear that, you might be intimidated because you think, well, yeah, John was a big light, but I feel just like this little light. I don't know much about Scripture. I I never went to Bible school. And friends, the really cool thing about even just a little bit of light is the darker it is, the more you can see it. Tim, can you just shut the lights off just so, so we can see this. Now, this would work really good if we could figure out how to do all the lights. We didn't try this in the first service because I was like, there's so many lights, but can you all see this? If it was pitch black in here, trust me, you would be like, that is a megaphone of light, a spotlight. It's not very much, but it's enough. And when someone is going through a dark time, a time where they can't see anything, your job isn't to be the Messiah or to be the Savior, your job is just to point to the bigger light of Christ. Now, this doesn't do it justice, but the reality is all of us have different levels of knowledge of Jesus, and that's okay because none of us are called to be the light of Christ. We're called to point people to Christ. I want you to commit in your hearts this Christmas that 2022 will be a year of pointing people to Jesus. You can do that in two ways. Commit to lead your family in the word. This just this year, we started doing something every single day. It's something that we did inconsistently, but now we do it every single day. I read a story from this little Bible book that I read to the kids earlier, and I'm telling you, it has literally transformed my daughter. I think there have been two things this year that have been so incredible for her. Number one, um, school happened. <laughs> and just her being in an environment where there are other kids and just coming out of COVID, school has been so amazingly awesome for her. But there was a sermon I preached a couple months ago about the power of um, allowing your kids to grow spiritually in the first five years of their lives. And there is a lot of statistics out there. If you just look up James Dobson and childhood and gospel, and there's so, much to, so many statistics out there about how important it is for our children to begin to think spiritually and to begin to see Jesus from a young age. And we just, all we do is we just read this Bible. You know what's beautiful about reading a book like this is you don't have to have a seminary degree. You just have to be able to read So we just read this Bible, and I just ask Harper, do you understand this? What do you think about this? What's happening here? And Judah, of course, he gets distracted by his food half the time. He's still three. But Harper is tuning in. She's starting to hear this stuff. She's starting to think about it. If you you think that a five-year-old can't grasp spiritual truth, you haven't spent time with a five-year-old. I'm telling you, parents, it is so important to be committed to pointing the light to Jesus and helping them see who he really is. Don't let Christmas be a materialistic holiday. Let it be a spiritual holiday infused with the light of Christ. They are not too young to get it, even if they fall asleep in the back seat. <laughs> even if they fall asleep. And this is really true of any experience in our life, not just Old Testament stories. If it's true, it will eventually point to Jesus because Jesus says, I am the truth. I am the life. No man comes to the Father except through me. If there's anything that is true that leads to Jesus, you can affirm it starting with Scripture, but it goes on before beyond that. The second thing I want you to commit to this next year is commit to sharing the light of Christ with others. 
after the few years that we've had, I can tell you, yeah, there have been a lot of people in church that have just sort of lost their way. They've become disconnected. Statistics say that 30% of the folks that went to church before are just gone. No one knows where they are, but the truth is God knows where they are. And God also knows where everyone is. And there has been a, a, an an instigation of questions because of the pain and suffering and confusion and frustration and disappointment of the last few years. We have seen a lot of people come into the church trying to figure out, what is it about this world that I, that, that I can understand? What is it that God wants to do? Who is God? Does he love me? And these, these questions that we have. And friends, we have to be committed to sharing God's word with our family, but we also have to be sharing, committed to sharing God's light with those in the world that we live in. I want you to commit to sharing the light of Christ with others. I met a new friend this week. Um, his name is Alex. He got connected to someone in our church who was selling their house. And long story short, they started talking about Jesus. And I love hearing when God's people talk about Jesus. And she said, oh, I think you would really connect well with my pastor. So she texted us both. She's really proactive. She's shining her light. And so Alex and I met for coffee just a few days ago. And we're sitting there, and I'm listening to his story. And it's just a crazy story. Didn't grow up in the church. Um, in fact, came to Christ because someone reached out to him through a Facebook group that he was a part of, an agnostic Facebook group that he was a part of. And he just began to share Jesus with him, share scriptures with him. And eventually, he came to Christ. And it's like the lights just came on in Alex's life. And he, he could begin to understand, like, why this happened and all these things. And he was started to grow and he started to read his Bible and he started to pray. And he was just telling me how he's worked in, um, in, the, in the field of real estate. And in his office, there's not a lot of Christians. And he said he started to share uh, with one of his best friends. He's built up a relationship with him. And he just started to share Jesus with him just within the last couple of weeks. And he said that the conversation, he's never brought it up, but he realized how deep of questions his friends had. And they started to have this incredible conversation. He said, one of the things I noticed was that I just felt so good. It's like, the, it's like the fire of God was just like inside of me. And it was like, I just couldn't stop. The words were just flowing out. And I knew exactly what to say. And he looked at me and goes, I don't know who I was. But in that moment, I'm not, I didn't grow up with the Bible. But it's like, I just had words for his questions. And I had stuff to say to him. And I'm like, Alex, it's because that's God speaking through you. Like, that's what God's called you to be and to do. He hasn't called you to sit in a chair and just listen your whole life. He's called you to get out there and do it, to be in a career and to be the the light that he's called you to and the light that he's placed in your life will be visible to other people. All you have to do is click it on, turn it on, let him flow through you, let him do it. He's done all the hard work. And meeting this 26-year-old man who is recognizing the voice of God in his life was so inspiring to me because now he's beginning to see his world and his reality by the prism of God's word. You see, that's what I believe happens when we begin to share God's word in our family. We begin to share God's word in the light of Christ with others. Most of the light that we see in the world is just the white light that comes from the sun. But the variation in color comes from different wavelengths found within that white light. And what happens when a ray of white light comes is it, 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 it sometimes hits these little droplets of water, and we see that as a rainbow, right? You see this big, beautiful arc with all of these different colors in it, all the colors of the rainbow, as they say. And that's what happens when a single ray of light hits a prism, is it bends it just slightly, and it opens up the colors of the rainbow. And when we are committed to God's word, sharing God's word, not just to our family, but with others, we begin to see God's truth displayed in ways that we didn't understand before. Friends, that is because the spiritual truth that Jesus brings is the ultimate reality in the universe that we live in. Jesus would go on to say this about himself. This was all John speaking about Jesus, but Jesus would pick up this theme of light. And in John chapter 8, verse 12, he would say this. Jesus spoke to the people once more and said, I am the light of the world. If you follow me, you won't have to walk in darkness anymore. 
because you will have the light that leads to life. Friends, the light that, that we see at Christmas time, whether it's the lights on houses or the lights on our tree, is all meant to point us spiritually to the origin of that light. The birth of Jesus is the birth of true light. But it wasn't just the moment that he was born that exposed us to all of, all of spiritual light because Jesus created light. So all light was created through him, but all light points to the light of Christ because Jesus is the ultimate light in our world. But he says a couple words here that if you miss, you, 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 can't, you can't experience the prism or the, or the colorful world that seeing reality through the lens of Christ brings. He says this, if you will follow me. Jesus makes it very conditional. I don't want you to think that you can see the, the colors of creation spiritually if you haven't intentionally given your heart to Christ. If you haven't taken that step that the Holy Spirit has asked you to take over and over and over, God's calling you. He wants you to come to him. He's given you every provision to understand. And all you need to do is take that very first step. And when you take that first step, God begins to open your eyes to see things from your past in your present. He begins to show you things about your future. When you open up the Bible, it's like the words begin to pop off the pages and they become alive to you. This is how C.S. Lewis said it. I believe in Christianity as I believe that the sun has risen, not only because I see it, but because by it I see everything else. When Jesus said, I am the light of the world, he is, he is, he is challenging you to state your belief, but he's also challenging you to do something about it. Christianity is not just a faith of belief. It is a faith of action. And Je Jesus says it so clearly, if you will follow me, if you will trust me, if you will take that single step, if you will continue to trust me in the day-to-day, -day, in your finances, in your relationships, in your career, I will, I will do what you can't do on your own. I'll not only help you see, guide your path, expose your sin, but I will reveal truth to you. I will reveal your future to you. I will take you to places where you couldn't go on your own. And friends, this is probably the best gift that you can give to someone who's walking in darkness. Can you imagine not having answers to some of life's deepest questions? These worldview questions that all of us have, questions of origin, identity, meaning, morality, and destiny, can you imagine not being able to answer the question, where did I come from? Doesn't matter if you were born in Africa or Asia or South America, at some point in your life, you're going to ask that question. Can you imagine not being able to answer the question, who am I? I have Christians who don't know how to answer that question. And my response is, get back in God's word and let him speak to you because he knows who you are. <laughs> how about the question of meeting? What is my purpose? How should I live? The question of morality. Just because I can do it doesn't mean I should do it. You know, science never seeks out to answer that question. <laughs> like, you could be a scientist and love God with all your heart, mind, and soul. You can be a scientist and not believe in God. But that question won't be answered in terms of science. That question is answered by God. How should I live? The final question, the question of destiny is what happens when I die, is a question that all of us who have placed our faith in Jesus know the answer to. In fact, all of these questions, though they are deep questions, they are questions that have answers. They are questions that as we open up scripture and ask God to speak to us, he does. They are questions that are complicated and yeah, they're not black and white. All of them are beautiful because we see the answers through the spectrum of Christ and the colors of creation and the colors of the world we live in and the colors of the reality that we're tr constantly trying to interpret bear down on us in ways that give us a deep sense of fulfillment. Or, or you can just give someone at your work a gift card. <laughs> can you imagine how short we fall every year when we don't think about the spiritual depth 
of the questions that people are walking around carrying in their heart, burdened by. And yet, they're not simple, but we have the answers. And all of them, all of them point straight to Jesus. The one who made the light, the one who is the ultimate light. Jesus claimed this for himself. I am the light of the world. If you follow me, you won't have to walk in darkness any longer because you will have the light that leads to life. If you're here today and you've never committed your heart to Christ, maybe you're here because your neighbor's kid was singing and they invited you or you're connected to someone or, hey, it's Christmas, it's tradition. I want you to know, I want you to hear this. God has so much more for you in 2022. I'm not promising that life is going to be easy, but by the way, every worldview has to answer that question. Why is there pain and suffering in the world? It's disappointing when you ask an atheist that question because there's no answer. But within Christianity, it's beautiful to see how God redeems even the hardest part of our lives and points us and puts us on a road that leads us to deeper sense of fulfillment and love for people. You see, when we look to Christ, we have someone who will guide us all throughout our life. And the beauty of Christmas is that we can celebrate that he's actually physically been where we've been. He's endured the suffering that we're enduring. He's experienced the betrayal and the abandonment and the hardship and the frustration and the disappointment. These are all themes that we've experienced in these last few years because of COVID and because of the transitions and because of the changes. And God wants to reach out to the people in your life so desperately bad. And he wants to reach out to you. And he wants to remind you that he is Emmanuel. He is the light of the world. And if you will trust him with everything, he will be faithful to fulfill every promise he's ever made to you. I promise you that. It won't be easy. It'll be worth it. Would you stand with me this morning? You might be here and you might be saying, I've never placed my trust in Christ And I'll be honest, I don't know exactly where that moment is where people experience salvation for the first time, where their hearts cry out. But I'm pretty convinced God knows. So what we do every church service is we try to end on a prayer that gives people an opportunity to say, God, I need you. I want to trust you. Help me with my unbelief. And God is faithful to turn the lights on, to record the salvations, to put your name in the Lamb's Book of Life. And we do things like commitment cards and all that, but God knows. So I want to just give you an opportunity to just let your heart be honest with the Lord this morning. And if that's where you are, just pray this prayer with me and make it your own. Father, help us to follow Jesus because he is the light of the world. And I have been walking in darkness and I choose today to follow you, to believe that you lived this life that you taught, you healed, you delivered, and you died, and you rose again. And you can teach me how to answer those questions that Jordan brought up and how to live for you for the rest of my life. I give you my heart, and I invite you to lead me. Father, be our Savior, but be our Lord. Jesus, be our Savior and be our Lord every day and make this Christmas meaningful by turning on the light of the world in our hearts. We commit ourselves to you right now in the name.